So they probably would have, you know, they would have had to be like 2690 to make the next team, for example. Well, that, that's probably not going to make the team. So, so what it means is that uh, uh, there will be, it's harder to make the national team. I think as a whole, for the, the, for the chess in the U.S., it's a good thing that the, the standards are raised as high as possible. Individually, it's a bit tougher, I think, uh, you know, because, you know, you know, Jeffrey was so close and now he's going to have to move down charter. Uh, but he is the highest rated player uh, in the world under 18, I believe, right now. I have to check check that. But he's about 2675-ish, 2680. Uh, then we have uh, Sam Sevion, who's about 2650, similar age, you know, but he's, I think they're third and fourth uh, under 20 or 21 in the world right now. So that's good to have in there. Uh, also, though, the player that really impresses me also is Christopher uh, uh, Rujan uh, Yu. He just turned 12. He just became an IM, and he's about maybe 24, 30 feet eight. But he's improving. He won against a 20, his first 2700 just recently, uh, and he made his final IM one. He was in contention for a GM one for most of the tournament. But there's more good players than that. I mean, I could rattle off a list of another, you know, six players that are probably about 25, 20 to 25, 50, uh, that are around 16 to 18 years old. Uh, so I think it's important to have this kind of depth and uh, because there's no, uh, you know, you might think that, you know, a player that's like 16 and it's 2650 is automatically going to be like 2750, but there's no guarantees. You know, it's like climbing Mount Everest, you know, and uh, without oxygen, you can't get, the air gets thinner and thinner up there. But I do know this, the more strong players you have and that are working hard in their chest and the more strong tournaments we have things in St. Louis, not just the Sinkfield Cup and the US Championship, but all these uh, uh, you know, round robin terms they have throughout the year. If you combine those three ingredients, you know, strong players, s strong work capacity, and strong competition, then they will rise, and some of them will keep going up higher and higher. So, you know, we'll see. We'll see what, uh, what the future holds. But the situation looks much brighter than it did uh, 10 years ago, or five years ago, or even like two years ago. So, but but for the rest of the world, they also get stronger too. So, no guarantees. You know. Yes. Um, what's a, 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 a comment? Um, I just looked it up. Poland India was four draws, and uh, Poland finished fourth as a result. If I believe that if Poland had won any one of those games, they would have taken first place on five years. Right, and see, I think that uh, the uh, that that may, that sounds about right. Uh, India is a very strong team. Uh, you know, they were the rating favorite against Poland, but also, you know, at the end of the day, like when we're playing our match against China, I, I don't know what their thoughts were on it, but you just have to play normally. You can't just like you know pull the goalie and just like you know try to like you know you know hero ball if you want to call that, you know, with all apologies to Carmelo Anthony fans here, uh, it doesn't work. You know, I mean, you have to, you know, you're playing strong countries, players, you have to play regulation. You know, you try hard, but you, you have to, you have to keep it the positions given. Let me ask a question as well. What is your best theory as to why the Russians have not won since 2002, in spite of being the Team, I think every time except 2018. Well, uh, first they did, they did tie, to be fair, in 2012. I mean, they lost on tie break to Armenia. Mean, there was a lot of luck there. Uh, they have had success in the World Team Championship in the past, in the, you know, since in the post Kasparov era. Uh, it's an event that's held every in the off year, and it's also a very strong tournament. I would say, uh, you know, first off, also, if you look at it, I mean, I would sort of sum up our result as the last Olympiad. If you told me before the Olympiad you were tied for first, I would shake your hand and I would be happy, okay? Now, at, when the Olympiad finished, I was both happy and a little bit sad, you know, because I felt that, you know, we did great what we could have done, we left a little bit on the table. But, uh, but there were like six or seven teams averaging over 2,700. 
no team can just like say, well, we're the favorite, we're just going to win this thing, you know. I mean, why don't you just mail us the medals? So I would say that you know, even Russia, like in the Olympiad, like that, finishing for third, okay, that was, you know, they might not have been the medal they wanted, but it was not a bad result, okay? Now, as to why they haven't won, I think to some extent, I think that, you know, they might, I mean, I don't know, they might feel a slight jinx, you know, I mean, you know, just it's so, so, happens so often, they might feel a sort of self fulfilling prophecy. But it's not for lack of preparing for the Olympiads. They take it super seriously. They have like all these training camps for the Olympiad. And then also, they have serious financial rewards if they were successful. I didn't mention that part to you, did I? Why your, uh, all your sons and daughters here should become professional players. Well, if they lived in Azerbaijan, I heard stories that, you know, they would each receive, each member of their team, if they won gold medals, would receive several hundred thousand dollars. And I do know for a fact that when Armenia won it one year, they all got Mercedes Benz and cars. Another time they all got condos in downtown Yerevan. Don't know the exact commercial value of those. And a third time they sort of run out of things to give them, so they just gave them like checks for fifty thousand dollars. Okay. Uh, I'd like to say that I've seen those for US yet. Um <laughs> play for the glory. <laughs> Uh, no, we, we see, you know, we're, we're a different situation. We're, you know, we're a membership-based organization. Our federation treats us quite well. They, they, they give us uh, quite generous honoraria, and we receive, you know, some bonuses. But, uh, but uh, no, I mean, it's not like we all just mentioned. No, no, I mean, that we receive things, yeah. Uh, uh, or even a horse, I would take. But, uh, so, so all that being said, uh, I would say that, uh, for Russia that, I mean, I mean, what advice can you give? I mean, you've got great players, but I would say that it's possible, just possible, I mean, I'm not to duck the question. It's almost like maybe they have too much pressure, maybe. Maybe, I don't know, hard to say. But, I mean, I, if, would I be surprised if one of the next would be out? No, I mean, they're a very good team. They could easily win. Yes? Uh, aside from technical preparation, what would the team do between rounds to set themselves up for success? Anything in terms of nutrition, sleep, any pre-game rituals? Uh, you know, it's funny you should mention that. Uh, one of my jobs was to bring their snacks to the board okay. and to know which were the right times to give them their snacks. So some of them it was green tea. Some of them it was like dark chocolate. Some of them it was coffee. You know, it depended on the individual players. In Sam Shankman's case, Bananas, only bananas. So, uh, so you know, you, and, and and he wouldn't always eat bananas. So sometimes, you know, I bring a banana for a couple of days, and then he'd look at that banana and he said, "No, you got to get a new banana." You know. <laughs> so, so uh, yes, but but in some cases, but it's so much better. In Hikaru's case, it's Red Bull. Now you can't ask me whether he drinks the Red Bull or not. Anymore. Is he okay to think that? Yes. Well, I didn't say that. Don't it's, don't ask. Don't tell. I won't. I can't tell you whether he actually drinks the Red Bull or not. <laughs> but what I can tell you is back in the day, in 2010, the Olympiad was in Athens, Greece, and Hikaru was a major Red Bull fan, and he was drinking like a couple of them each game, and they test you after the games, but you know. The substances in Red Bull are, they're approved by the Olympic Committee. Maybe not approved, but they don't, they don't count against you. But the point was that at a certain point in the Olympiad in Hachimansis, which is a small town in Siberia, we ran out of the Red Bull. And we couldn't find any Red Bull. So then there was a Russian product. And the name of it, I kid you not, was Hell. And this product uh, was probably had twice the caffeine to twice the sugar, uh, twice the motor fuel or whatever they mix in it, and he drank, he was drinking this stuff. And one match, you know, it was a very long game, it was very tense, you know, he'd eaten like five or six hours before the game, because it was such a long game. So I started giving him one of these, and he asked me for another one. And I should have been like a bartender and cut him off at a certain point, but at the end of it, he was just like, you know, it was like this, all this with these hands were all there, and uh, it was uh, he was. It took him a while for him to you know, sort of come down. Yeah, yeah. I mean, 
And the older monkey ads, you know, they used to have smokers. And so sometimes you see these ashes you know, from all the cigarettes. But since the 90s, you know, no one's been smoking, thank God. But, but they have smoking area, though? They, there are smoking areas. But, you know, I mean, of the first, like, 20 or 30 players in the world, this was the only person I could think of is a smoker. I remember when the Olympiad, the world team was in Yingbo in 2011, and there were, out of 10 teams, five players each, 50 players, there were exactly seven smokers. All five Egyptians, Yasser, Sarawan, and Grisha. And they used to, the four Egyptians who were playing in Yasser and Grisha, they were kind of like, like they became friends. During the <laughs> <laughs> uh, was Kranich smoking too? Or? He I've did in the past. Maybe he does from time to time, but uh, I don't. I didn't see him smoking during the weekend. For one thing, it's a handicap because you have to go and walk to the smoking area. It wasn't close by. You know, you just lose time on the clock. Yeah. So, any last questions? Yes. yes. Could you discuss a little bit about performance enhancing drugs in chess and sort of compare and contrast chess to some of the, the blood doping and some of the performance enhancing techniques that are used in, in the more physical sports? Sure. So, so chess, why would there be, is there any magic drug that will help you play better? Not that I know of. If there was, there would be some player consuming massive quantities. Okay. There, there's not. Okay. No, I don't. I don't think so. Um, I mean, you gain something, you lose something. Probably. You probably might be more alert, but then you're going to have some problems with your bladder, and you're going to come down from. What are you going to do? Take more Red Bull then? So, I would say that uh, the the reason why do they test for? It, okay. And they do test for substances, and what they're testing for, like anabolic steroids, for example, and caffeine. But uh, anabolic steroids wouldn't help you. And caffeine, I don't, the quantities that they want you to not exceed are so high that I don't know that you could physically consume that much coffee. I think it would go out of you before you could keep, you know, it would just go in and out of you and you'd never reach that threshold. So I think the real question is why do they even have it? And the answer is very simple. Uh, there's always been this idea to make chess in Olympic sport, as in the regular Olympics. And in 2000, in Sydney, uh, in the 2000 Olympics, I think it was, they had an exhibition match between Shirov and Anand. And uh, it was quite well publicized, and it was a positive thing. And, uh, and then ever since then, chess has had this observer status in the Olympic movement. But if you read you know, the, the, the bylaws, Chess could not be a winter Olympic sport. It's not played on snow or ice, thankfully. OK, that being the case, that only leads to summer games. And they have so many sports already. They're trying to wean it down. I mean, so I think the chances of chess ever really being an Olympic sport are very small. So then why do they still keep this observer status? And it's a very clear reason why. There's some federations in the world that this is very beneficial to have this official relationship. For example, like the Dutch Federation. Normally you think of the Dutch people, they're like very tolerant. They would never want to have drug testing for some silliness that couldn't do anything. But because uh, chess is a member of the, is an observer status in the Olympic sporting movement, the Dutch sporting, bar, uh, sporting uh, Body. Yeah, yeah, and they're, and they're, and the, the, for all sports, they give the Dutch Chess Federation uh, a couple hundred thousand euros a year. So they give them like good money, and the Dutch players are willing to, uh, you know, adhere to these regulations and, and provide samples periodically. Okay, and I get the impression that they're not alone. There's probably like at least you know a dozen to two dozen federations that benefit from this relationship. And I think some FIDE officials, at least in the past, Kirsten and the in particular, thought it was very beneficial to have this close relationship. But, you know, myself, I, I mean, the US players, if they could avoid it, they would prefer not to. It just seems kind of like nonsense. Uh, yes. 
One question. So you mentioned uh, training camps that some other teams regularly yes. have. Is this something that the U.S. team ever had, or is we some players do it individually, like with small groups. Uh, the problem is really it's not that they would be so much against it. It's more a question of like trying to find time and schedule to have it, because. Usually there's always some tournaments coming on. It would be very difficult to get all five players at once, okay? In particular, when uh, the first three were all playing like in very elite tournaments simultaneously, then it became very problematic to find the time. But we have had some times uh, where like before I think it's from 2012, where some of the guys on the team got together. And it was really a good thing. Uh, but usually what we do now instead is we try to get to uh, like we got to Tbilisi this time two or three days ahead, and then we get a little chess, and we socialize before. And that was kind of a makeshift camp, if you will. Okay, so, well, I'm going to pass the baton to my better half here.